Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Lambert County Board of County Commissioners Administrative Matters Meeting for today, November 5th, 2019. I'm glad you're all here, as is our tradition. Uh, would you be kind enough to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, the next item on our administrative matters agenda is public comment period. It looks like at this point we have five people that have signed up to offer public comment. The first one is Mr. Greg Leverett. Welcome, Greg. Come on up. I have a feeling uh, you know the routine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about Kathleen McNamara first, but I want to add something about the Sheriff's Department. So one time I called the Sheriff's Department, and a woman answered the phone, and she said, well, I said, she said, what are you doing now? And I said, oh, I have... My father retired, so I help people pull calves, and I do phototomies. And she says, well, if you're doing phototomies, you're breaking the law. I said, how am I breaking the law? She says, well, you're doing something that veterinarians do. And I said, do you know what a phototomy is? She says, no. And I said, well, if you don't know what a phototomy is, how do you know if I'm breaking the law? And then I said, what's your name and badge number? And she refused to give it to me. <laughs> and I wanted her to testify in court, but the court shut down that whole proceedings. The next thing I wanted to talk, I really came here to talk about Kathleen McNamara. But uh, recently there was a, the appellate court found that the city of Fort Collins and the Department of Human, the Fort Collins Police Department, the um, Department of Human Services violated their Fourth Amendment right to due process and overturned their convictions. So I, I understand that you gave those DHS employees awards for their work on that dire case. Is it common to give awards to county employees that violate people's uh, uh, constitutional rights and break the law? Is that kind of common? And you know, the thing that I wanted to talk about, Kathleen McNamara, so she, during while I was talking to her, she said, you don't get along with one of your ex-wife's friends. And I said, yeah, because you make stupid comments about horses. And I also told her my father was a theragenologist she said, so do you own any horses? I said, I haven't owned a horse since I was 18. Well, how do you expect me to think you know more about horses than a real estate agent that owns three, three horses? I said, well, I, I didn't own one. I didn't say I was around any. And if you go into that, under Steve Johnson on my blog, you'll see that horse with that horse sold for a million dollars. Right? Well, that horse died. Now, do you think you get somebody that's doing reproductive work on horses? get somebody who's qualified as a theragenologist, or do you go to a real estate agent that owns three horses that maybe value at $5,000 tops? And anyway, she's, she, later on during depositions of her, she didn't understand what a theragenologist was. Well, it wasn't like she had to do a lot of work to find this out. All she had to do was walk across the street to Drake Street to the CSU Vet School. She would have met your new good friend, Patricia Olson, or Dr. Mortimer, and Patricia Olson knows my father quite well. Dr. Mortimer, when my father wants students to come out and help do fertility, do fertility testing at the Laster Ranch, would say, well, I won't send a student. I'll come out and do it. You know, they were interacted with my father quite a bit. But yet, I find it appalling that you guys would give awards to your employees that violate the constitutional rights of people. And that is just wrong. And why those people aren't fired is beyond belief when they're conducting criminal activity. Thank you, Greg. Next, what, the next person who has signed up is Sonia. Sonia, I always get your last name. Is it Keating? Ketting. Ketting, thank you, Sonia. Welcome. Thank you, Greg. So I'm here on the oil and gas issue, and um, we have seen the suggested rules that have, have been uh, released to all interested parties and we're very anxious to hear what the public comment period will be that uh, Commissioner Johnson has talked about and Commissioner Donnelly referenced public comment and uh, minority report and the process there we have not heard that uh, 
We have a lot of issues uh, to bring up. Uh, one of my lead issues is air quality, which is why I'm wearing this T-shirt. Uh, you may have seen this logo before. F is the air quality rating for uh, much of the Front Range, and um, that's due to ozone non-attainment, serious non-attainment, based on the EPA's measurement. And we intend to do all we can to begin educating county citizens about this because we have an idea that many people think Colorado has wonderful air because we're Colorado, simply because. But uh, that left us long ago, um, over 10 years ago, and it's gotten worse, worse, worse. And I'm not seeing it addressed. I'm, I'm seeing air quality addressed in the uh, proposed rules. But I want to just pull one out as a for instance. R under air quality rule three, environmental protection agency reduced emission completions shall be used for all completions and well work overs following hydraulic fracturing unless the application demonstrates that it is economically infeasible or impractical to utilize such a system. That's one point that is not in the spirit of SB 181 and that is also asking the fox to guard the hens. Um, multiple places, economically feasible or practical. That gives the power back to the industry, and it is not the spirit of SB 181. And then later in leak detection, semi-annual leak detection and repair by the industry, twice a year, I'm a little concerned. So um, we will be educating citizens on air quality and other issues, as we have been doing with our um, really good uh, public presentation from Detlev Helmig, uh, who, who does 24-7 monitoring over Boulder Reservoir and has the evidence on the damage that it's doing to our county, most of it coming over from Weld County. Um, and I see nothing in here about a negotiation with Weld County. What happens if Weld County opens a whole bunch of new wells, makes our air worse, and we're still opening them? No one's weighing this against the air quality for the citizens. So that's my concern. Thank, Thank you, for Sonia. Listening. Uh, just a quick comment, if I may. Uh, one is that uh, I think at the, the last uh, task force meeting on October 30th, it is my understanding that there was discussion of a um, at least a draft schedule. And my understanding of that is that uh, we sh what, what people have seen now is an outline of the draft regulations. And I believe by early January, we will see a, uh, uh, a more clear uh, draft, reg you know, draft regulations, and then there will be open houses and public hearings after that. So January, the beginning of January, I think, is when people should be watching for more details on the draft regulations that were discussed at the last task force meeting. Secondly, Sonia, I appreciate everyone coming, and they're always welcome to come. Uh, right now, what I think we need is, is specific uh, uh, recommendations based on that outline what you think is good in there, what is not good in there, what we need to consider changing. We have them. Where do they go? We don't have They can be sent to uh, our planners that are working on this. And I believe, if it's not already up there, this, um, this schedule will be up on the website. And I think we are setting up a process where people can submit you know, specific comments to the, the outline of draft regulations. But right now, I believe you can, you can send them to people like Matt Lafferty, Leslie Ellis, you know, the folks who are facilitating, helping to facilitate this process. Will the task force continue to meet through January? Uh, I, I don't want to, I'm happy to talk to you offline. Okay. All right. I just wanted to provide some information and uh, at this point it's really helpful for constructive feedback uh, to help us formulate what we will be presenting to the public in January. Well, the, the sense of quiet at the moment. I'd like to invite Deb, Deb York, I bet, oh, there you are, hello. hello. Oh, everyone is, uh, uh, their, uh, their sartorial splendor matches, that's great, <laughs> or most people. Yes, we came as a team ah, today. Welcome. Thank you, it, I'm Deb York, thank you for letting me speak to you today. Um, the critical tenet of SB 181 requires realignment and reform of commission rules to prioritize protection of public health, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife from adverse impacts on our air, water, soil, and biological resource resulting from oil and gas operation. As such, the current euphemisms in the draft of the Larimer County regulations, such as cost effectiveness, technical feasibility, the state has said in their white paper that was released this week that these euphemisms cannot be applied when, re when regulating oil and gas and have to be removed from the COGCC rules. In addition, um, the, the term minimizing adverse impacts was defined, and as you know, the uh, definition of waste was redefined. 
However, our Larimer County draft regulations are replete with these euphemisms and they're designed to undermine the regulations. So, um, the, then addition, this, there's a severability clause that is kind of the icing on the cake. It reads, if any sections, clause, provision, or portion of these re regulations are found to be unconstitutional or otherwise invalid by a court of competent jurisdiction, and then goes on to say they each need to be, um, uh, each need to be look in, looked at independently. So we've repeatedly been assured by county staff that if L Lerma County regulations do not meet the state regulation standards, that they'd be changed to comply. And yet this severability clause seems to imply it has to go to court, that every single obscured by euphemism regulation would have to be filed separately as a lawsuit, if I'm understanding it right. And I just wonder how much that would cost, cost the county. Like, what would be an estimate of how much it would cost to take every single regulation to court? And we pay for that. So I'm asking the county commissioners to be accountable for that. And I'd like an answer if I could get one. Thank you, Deb. And actually, just to back up a bit, I neglected to mention that um, this morning I am accompanied by Commissioner Steve Johnson. Uh, Commissioner Donnelly is excused because he is at a uh, transportation-related meeting in Denver. And that's why you're all fortunate to have me attempting to chair this meeting. Right. Next we have Stacy. Stacy Lynn, welcome. Good morning. I am Stacy Lynn, investigative journalist, Fort Collins, Larimer County. Two weeks ago, Larimer County was served notice of intent for motion to show cause for public records law violations. That happened because Sheriff Justin Smith said the record I was requesting does not exist. This is the record that Sheriff Justin Smith says does not exist. The reason Sheriff Smith lied and said the record does not exist is this. This record, the one that Sheriff Justin Smith says does not exist, holds evidence of crimes that were committed by Sheriff Justin Smith and other ranking officers at the Larimer County Sheriff's Office. This record that Sheriff Justin Smith says does not exist shows that County Attorney David A. Rode knew about the crimes, but he did not report those crimes to an external agency. This record that Sheriff Justin Smith says does not exist is not the only record that shows Sheriff Justin Smith intentionally lied and covered up crimes. There are others. There is more. This record and other records in other cases show that county attorneys, district attorneys, law enforcement officers and judges worked with Sheriff Justin Smith to commit crimes and then they worked together to hide their criminal actions. As a woman who has friends and family who are attorneys and law enforcement officers at the local, state and federal levels, I am deeply and traumatically sickened by what this means to the careers of the people who are involved. If the Larimer County Attorney's Office has not already done so, it should warn Sheriff Justin Smith that he should stop lying, which actually means that Sheriff Justin Smith should stop talking. This record that Sheriff Justin Smith says does not exist is a legal nightmare for Larimer County. The financial payout on this case will be astronomical. When I leave this room, I will be talking with the FBI. I suggest you do the same when they contact you. It's unfortunate that Commissioner Donnelly is not here today because he knew and he didn't stand up. 
Steve Johnson knew and he didn't stand up. Stacy Lynn, thank you. Best of luck to you all. The next person who has signed up is Gayla Martinez. Gayla, welcome. Hello. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Gayla Martinez, and I want to thank you for this opportunity to make some comments regarding the odors section of the proposed regulations for oil and gas. <clears throat> the word odors refers to airborne chemical contaminants. We're not talking here about the smell from the bean dip that went bad in the back of the refrigerator. We're talking about toxic chemicals. Measurements recorded by NSTAR at the Boulder Reservoir, and I can provide you with a link to that website if you don't already have it. I already have it. I assume so. Show ongoing toxic gas emissions that are linked to oil and gas operations by the presence of propane and ethane markers. Section C, or G, excuse me, Section G of the draft regulations directs operators to limit the release of these con chemical contaminants, quote, to the extent reasonably possible, end quote. What is reasonably possible? This is not a measurable criteria. It doesn't specify which gases can or cannot be emitted, nor in what quantities. And I would point out that the emissions we are subjected to all along the front range are already clearly unreasonable. <clears throat> Section G then makes the suggestion, and it's only a suggestion, not a requirement, that residents, and by the way, it does not specify which residents are to be included, but anyway, some residents might be notified before well completions so that they can voluntarily seal up their homes or evacuate. This would be laughable if it were not such an egregious infraction of homeowners' rights. It seems to be saying that people are expected to close all their windows and swelter in their homes on a hot summer's night, cancel their back backyard barbecues, tell their children they can't go outside to play, all for the sake of an industrial operation that should never be placed this close to inhabited dwellings in the first place. And this is only in regards to planned releases. What happens in the event of an accident or undetected leak, which, by the way, do take place with a fair amount of frequency? How is it reasonable to give an industry the right to gas people in their homes? Thank you. Thank you, Gayla. Thank you. Thanks all for being here. At this time, uh, there's no one else who has signed up, but is there someone? I was the first one to sign up. Did I sign up? I was at the first of the list, like 20 seconds. Yes, indeed, you did. Come on up, Karen. I was going to offer that opportunity. I just um, <laughs> did not see that. And That's also, okay. That's okay. Nancy. Welcome, Karen. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Karen Speed, 8310 Cherry Blossom Drive, Windsor in Larimer County. You may, uh, as she was saying, the T-shirts, I'll give a little more in depth on that. This is the 20th year that the State of the Air program led by the American Lung Association um, has ranks its top worst towns in the U.S. based on ozone, particle pollution, and a report to include populations that are at increased risk of asthma, cardiovascular disease, COPD, and lung cancer due to these results. With ozone, the top worst, the worst top 25 towns included Denver at number 12 and Fort Collins at number 24. Atlanta was ranked 25th. With the evaluation of ozone, the American Lung Association designates a report card grade based on data that was analyzed from official air quality monitors. In the state of Colorado, there are eight counties that are, were graded F, including the worst grade awarded, indicating the worst grade. Those counties are Arapahoe, Boulder County, Clear Creek, Douglas, Jefferson, La Plata, and of course, Larimer and Weld County, thus the shirt. 
We want to inform people that there's clearly a problem in the air we breathe on in most of the front range. In Well County, the pediatric cases of asthma reported were 6,400 and adult cases 20,917 in a one-year period. In Larimer County, the statistics on pediatric asthma were 5,437 with the adult cases at 25,586. That is over 4,500 more adult cases per year uh, in Larimer than in Well, but they are still both comparably um, bad. Unfortunately for Larimer County, the air patterns often move from the plains, bringing air from Greeley and Windsor, uh, which thanks to the mountainous topography we have here, hits the mountain wall and hangs over this area. That air then splits and some going north to Wyoming and the rest to uh, south towards Boulder. Also of interest is the influx of small oil companies into Colorado, say like from Texas or Wyoming to drill and frack. One such company has recently approached the Platte River Power Authority to, flack, to frack underneath the Rawhide Coal Power Plant. As I investigated that area and discussed this with a COGCC representative, it seems there is legitimate concern for some of these small outfits who will come to our state, drill and frack, possibly make a mess, get little to no significant production, then turn it over to possibly another lesser company. Or they could do what the oil and co gas company did from what the COGCC records show on Highway 392 in Windsor in Larimer County and just plug and abandon the well only to have it leak into the hill that it leads down to the Cache Laputa River and the Jody Reservoir at River West neighborhood. This is currently under reclamation with uh, test water wells drilled at the bottom of that hill to measure if toxins reach those two bodies of water. But the COGCC and the CDPHE are involved in repairing this disaster. And guess who pays for this? The citizens of Colorado. Where does that leave Colorado? Karen, Likely on Karen, the hook for companies. Respectfully, please go to come to your conclusion. I've got like one sentence. Thank you. Uh, likely on the hook for companies who are permitted to ruin the state by decisions made without considering the full consequences. Let's leave more fracking out of Larimer County. It is it is not worth it, even a hundred million dollars. Thank you very much. Uh, next is Nancy Garcia, and I apologize for overlooking your names on the list. I'm not sure if I was wearing my glasses at that time. <laughs> Welcome, Nancy. Please Good morning. introduce yourself. I'm Nancy yourself. Garcia. I live in Loveland. Um, I want to talk about the business of fracking, kind of on a larger scale. Um, it was news to me, and I thought I would share it with you. This is from uh, October 30th, Bloomberg News, an article called Frackers Scrap Idled Equipment Amid Shale Drilling Pullback. Apparently, the downturn in shale drilling has been so steep and so brisk that oil field companies are taking the unprecedented step of, of scrapping entire fleets of fracking gear. As stagnant oil prices and investor pressure discourage new drilling, the fracking industry that was growing so fast that it couldn't find workers as recently as two years ago now finds itself buried in a mountain of pipes and storage tanks. The U.S. oil field service has overshot the growth cycle again, resulting in a capacity glut. Roughly 10 percent of industry capacity already has been earmarked for the scrap heap, and the number of fracking crews deployed at, to well sites across the U.S. has already fallen to the lowest in more than two years. This is a graph that shows how far it's falling. So I'm just wondering why we would even consider allowing in industry that is likely not to be financially viable to drill and pollute our beautiful county and possibly declare bankruptcy or piggybacking on what Karen, what you just heard from Karen, um, go out of business, leave abandoned wells at great expense for the taxpayers to clean up. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. So at this time, is there anyone else who wishes to offer a public comment that may not have uh, signed up, signed on to the uh, sign-up sheet? Uh, since I hear from no one, I will close the public comment period and we'll go to the next item in the ag agenda, which is approval of the minutes. Commissioner Johnson, would you offer the appropriate min uh, motion? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move approval of the minutes for the week of October 28, 2019. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Welcome, Brenda. Good morning, Commissioners. How Please are you? tell us about the 
upcoming schedule. And thanks for all your hard work coordinating these matters. Thank you. On Monday, November 11th, the county offices will be closed in observance of the Veterans Day holiday. On Tuesday, November 12th at 8.30 a.m., Commissioner Kafalos will participate participate in the new employee orientation that's in the hearing room on the first floor. At 9 a.m., you have administrative matters. That's this meeting here in this room. At 1.30 p.m., you will have a commissioner budget retreat, and that's in the Poudre River Room on the first floor of the Larimer County Loveland campus um, at 200 Peridot Avenue in Loveland. On Wednesday, November 13th at 7.30 a.m., Commissioners Johnson and Kafalos may attend the Larimer County's Public Health Legislative Breakfast, and that's in the Carter Lake Conference Room on the first floor. 7.45 a.m., Commissioner Kafalos may attend the Larimer County Workforce Development Board meeting in the hearing room on the first floor. <coughs> At 10 a.m., Commissioner Donnelly will attend the Northern Colorado Regional Tourism Authority Board meeting in Windsor. At 10 a.m., Commissioner Kafalos will participate in the Ag Advisory Board interviews. At 12.30 p.m., Commissioner Kafalos will attend the Agricultural Advisory Board meeting on Blue Spruce here in Fort Collins. On Thursday, November 14th at 7.30 a.m., Commissioner Kafalos may attend the Fort Collins Downtown Development Authority Board meeting at the Rocky Mountain Innisfere here in Fort Collins. At 10.30 a.m., Commissioner Kafalos may attend the Colorado State University's pres President's Inauguration at Griffin Concert Hall here in the, at CSU in Fort Collins. At 11.30 a.m., Commissioner Johnson may attend the Larimer County Interagency Oversight Group Meeting at the Carter Lake Conference Room on the first floor. At 1.30 p.m., Commissioner Kafalos may attend the Office on Aging Advisory Council Meeting on Midpoint Drive here in Fort Collins. At 5.30 p.m., you have a joint public meeting with the Town of Estes Park regarding the land use planning agreement at the Estes Park Town Hall in Estes Park. On Friday, November 15th at 7.15 a.m., Commissioner Donnelly will attend the Executive Fair Board meeting at Lola Diner in Loveland. At 12 p.m., Commissioner Kafalos may participate in the Fort Collins Solonator Garden Ribbon Cutting at Trilby and College Avenue in Fort Collins. That would be all for the week. Thank you, Brenda. Commissioner Johnson, do you have any questions or comments? I do not. I, again, I just want to make sure it's clear that on Wednesday, when we make reference to the um, Workforce Development Board meeting, uh, Commissioner Johnson, of course, is the liaison. Right. And so it's uh, sometimes I go, but I, I know he's the liaison. So, and then as far as the uh, public health legislative breakfast, I, I suppose both of us might consider attending that. But I just want to make sure that it's clear that he's the liaison for the workforce development it's board. clear i just had put you as a tentative because i didn't know if you were going to split that and commissioner johnson is okay um, definitely going to the public health legislative breakfast okay. so it's all good thank you okay thank you great thank you brenda so now we move on to the uh consent agenda and just to clarify the purpose of the content agenda consent agenda is to allow the commissioners to spend um i, I mean basically it's administrative matters where there's no um, uh, controversy, uh, no, no opposition. We have some folks here to clarify things if need be. Uh, but on the consent agenda, we have, um, by my count, we have three agreements, and we have two resolutions. Also, my goodness, 19 miscellaneous items, and then one uh, liquor license approval and issuance commissioner johnson do you wish to take any of these items off of the consent agenda sir i do not nor do i uh please offer the proper motion all righty i move thank you mr chairman i move approval of the consent agenda for november 5th 2019 all in favor aye aye thank you um, commissioner johnson do you have any fabulous guests i do not meeting? I don't even have any unfabulous guests. <laughs> okay, uh, nor do I. So we will move, my goodness, we'll move right along. Um, County Manager Linda Hoffman, I imagine you have a few things to say about how you spent your week. Well, I actually spent my week uh, <laughs> with my first cold of the season. Oh. So the good news is I got that out of the way early. I typically only get sick like once a season, so I feel like I've checked that box for the year. Um, but when I got back, one of the interesting things I did at the end of the week was attend some training for the community corrections screening tool. There's a new law, and you're probably going to ask me the number, and I don't know, 
but it was passed to cause community corrections boards to have a screening tool that would look at uh, offenders coming out of state prison and potentially entering into community corrections programs. The state's concern is that there's not very universal decision making across the state in that some communities like ours will take uh, offenders that are more challenging and other community corrections uh, boards do not take those offenders. And so they are trying to get a better handle on how those decisions are made. Local review, so what? <clears throat> well, but I think that what they're thinking That's is... Why we have it, so the local communities can decide what's appropriate for their community. So the law says that each community can set up their own tool and that gives local control, but the state wants a tool. So um, in, okay. in Larimer County, we hired an expert from CSU. She's worked with us to develop the tool, and we got trained on it. And I, I shared your, Chris, your skepticism. Uh, I do not think that we're fixing a problem in Larimer County. But um, the legislature often fixes problems that don't exist only in their own mind. Well, nonetheless. Recently, at least anyway. Not when John and I were there. <laughs> but things have gone somewhere since. I believe, Commissioner Johnson, when you and I left the legislature, everything went downhill. Although I was there for a few more years, though. No, That's probably I, why. I, I take that back. <laughs> so <laughs> Larimer County is complying with the law. We've developed such a tool. Uh, it looks like it will meet our needs and if it does we can tweak the tool we are uh, on on schedule for creating it and it was interesting to see how they have scored it the other thing that is of note about the tool is it is a guide or an indicator it is not the decision maker so you go through the screening tool but you do your the the board is not required to accept the answer that comes out the end of the analysis. So do we know how much of Larimer County tax money the legislature and their infinite wisdom has wasted making us create a tool I that can, we didn't need? I can get that information for you if, okay. if it's of interest. And I would also add that I, at my request I asked that we get an abbre abbreviated presentation of this decision-making tool and I believe that will occur at our January uh, Community Corrections Advisory Board, our monthly meeting in January. Okay, good. Um, well, maybe the next item will go easier. <laughs> so, uh, we have been working for many months to set up a screening committee for IT projects, and the problem we're trying to solve here is that within our own county government organization, we want to make sure that the best ideas for uh, streamlining our processes, automating our processes, um, using our county resources to do technology projects are being aimed at the projects that will create the most impact. So right now what happens is there are some departments that are in the know and skilled at bringing projects forward. There are some um, departments that have their own sources of revenue rather than general fund contributions. And, and we think that some projects are being overlooked that might have more merit than those that are get, moving forward and getting IT help. So we're leveling the playing field in 2020 and all projects will come forward for that first analysis of what is the project, what would it do, how much would it cost, then it will go to the screening uh, pr committee to be ranked against other projects, and then funding would be uh, appropriated by the commissioners in many cases as the third step. But instead of the projects that could be overlooked not moving forward, this would raise that cream to the top and um, the screening committee is a critical step in that. So the committee's been formed. We had their first orientation meeting. Uh, 
it was interesting to see how the the committee members that have been selected by the service category teams um, kind of the light bulbs came on around the room of the critical role of this committee and it was uh, well done by our IT staff and Josh Fudge who's had a lot to do with this effort of getting the committee set up so I'm pleased to see that we will be up and running by January to better screen projects and and actually accomplish the ones that will be most impactful in our community in our organization and community um, we had people at the budget hearing last night which is surprising we don't usually have that and uh, we have another meeting in Estes Park tomorrow night and the strategic leadership committee met we didn't it didn't look like we had a very full agenda but because we only meet once a month uh, there was a lot of good information and um, and collaborative sharing of what's going on among the members of that group we get very good participation from our elected offices which I'm grateful for uh, my communication with other counties shows that that can be a challenge and here in Larimer County it's not um, our elected offices participate in countywide conversations and are very collaborative in their workings. So um, we talked about policy and updates in other areas and uh, upcoming events, and um, it's just a good partnership for us to meet together. Oh, thank you, Linda. Commissioner Johnson, would you like to share some of the things you did last week? I would. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, last week I got a call from a reporter from the Colorado Spr Springs Gazette Telegraph. They have been doing a series of very intensive stories, which Tom might be good, worth looking up on their website, about mental health communities that have taken on mental health, behavioral health issues, and how they've changed the whole discussion, I guess, around those issues. So they're They've gone to other states, and they are doing one on Larimer County. So they called and asked if I would go out to the site at the landfill for a picture, which I was happy to do, of course. An hour and 15 minutes later, after a video interview, some photos, portrait photos, a video <laughs> interview, videos of me walking around the site, I, I think it took them that long to get a good picture. In the snow, in prairie dog holes in the snow, um, so I hope we get a good story out of that. I got some wet shoes out of that, so I hope we get a good story out of that. And on a similar topic, um, yesterday the Behavioral Health Policy Council met down in Loveland. We had an outstanding presentation by Michael Rutenberg on some of the gaps in treatment in the county. Um, we had a long discussion about um, uh, recruitment of providers, what we could do maybe to be involved in recruiting providers to um, increase the capacity for treatment in our community and um, oh, there was one other thing I was going to share with you about that that just oh I know what it was um, Lori Stolen has begun work on the annual report which we will put out in February probably February early March about the accomplishments of the year 2019 there is a year-end event scheduled in early December out at the ranch I believe um, to celebrate the the first year of 2019 and Lori Stolen received a very significant honor I don't remember if I shared this with you guys last week I don't think I did because I think I had lunch with her last Tuesday but she was invited by the mayor of New York City to attend a conference uh, in a couple weeks in Manhattan it's a nationwide conference on public-private partnerships that have uh, increased access to mental health and behavioral health treatments and um, they are recognizing at this national conference Larimer County's work with the Policy uh, Advisory Council and also our Technical Advisory Council. So she's going to be on a, on a panel in a couple weeks to talk about how um, this was accomplished in Larimer County. And they picked the best examples across the country to highlight at this. The Surgeon General of the United States is keynote speaker at this conference. I can't remember the name of the conference, but it's a really significant honor for Larimer County. And Lori Stolen to be invited and in, to participate in that. So I'm looking forward to hearing um, maybe we can have come and have her share uh, 
about that experience with us when she gets back. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Johnson. And what I would share is the following that um, add to what's been said on Wednesday, last Wednesday, October 30th, uh, the three commissioners and um, uh, our assistant county manager and others, we met with the uh, CSU president, Joyce McConnell, here, and we had a good, good conversation, a good dialogue, and it's, uh, I think it's great to do that because it's, it's part of the relationship, relationship building process, and we looked at some potential areas where we might uh, collaborate. That was a very good meeting. On Friday uh, in the morning, November, Friday, November 1st, I attended the, uh, along with Commissioner Donnelly, the Larimer County Juvenile Gun Safety Coalition's recognition ceremony. So there was quite an assembly of folks at the ranch, and it, once again, it's a great example in my mind of tremendous uh, cooperation, collaboration. You had law enforcement people there from the sheriff's office, from the local police services. Uh, you had uh, folks from the district attorney's office. But essentially, it's an example of finding that some common ground on an issue that can often be very contentious, and that is gun safety. And in this case, we're talking about you know some really normal things that people ought to be doing uh, to make sure that um, uh, firearms are not taken out of people's drawers, that they're secured. Uh, apparently, there's quite a bit of data that shows in Larimer County how we have um, uh, people who may leave their firearms in their vehicles and they're not secured, and there are thefts of those firearms, and that, that can lead to um, uh, tragic, tragic consequences. So that was a great meeting. On Saturday, I had my uh, monthly Fort Collins community conversation at Old Town Library. Uh, we had about 15 people, uh, Matthew Behunin, Be Be uh, how, did, how did we say it? Behunin. Behunin uh, was there and he did a stellar job of presenting the budget. Uh, there were not too many glazed, uh, glazed looks. I think people were very engaged. And then afterwards I went up north to Buckeye and was invited to the Waverly annual meeting and I caught the second half. And they allowed me about 20 minutes where I could uh, give people a bit of an update on the budget, some other things, and also answer questions. And it was, it was a good meeting. I believe that's all I have to share. Uh, however, before we move to the next, uh, basically, adjournment, because we do not have any legal matters, I would like to invite our Larimer County Clerk and Recorder, Angela Myers, uh, to give us an update on the election. By the way, today is election day. And if you have not turned in your ballot, please do so by 7 p.m. And th welcome, uh, Clerk Myers. Would you introduce yourself for the record? Thank you so much, uh, 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 Commissioners. I am Angela Myers, your Larimer County Clerk and Recorder, and I am delighted to come and visit with you real briefly here on Election Day. It's a busy day for me in my office, so um, but I wanted to come up here and um, give one last shout out to our citizenry. Please do vote. Today is the last day to vote. It is election day. We will uh, require all ballots to arrive in our office by 7 p.m. today or they won't be counted. So it's very important the folks take that seriously. Um, I also want to give you a heads up on a few uh, new things in Larimer County this year um, that uh, folks might not be aware of or that I just want to champion at this point. We have um, a new location in Estes Park for our uh, VSPC. Right now, in this election, as required by law, we have three voting sites uh, set up for Larimer citizens. Please tell in, us what VSPC stands yeah, for. A voter service and polling center. And those sites are um, located here in the courthouse, um, in the Loveland Police and Courts Building, which has been typical for many years for us, as well as in Estes Park. The Estes Park location has moved this year, so it is in the Estes Park um, community center, which is a new uh, building for those folks up there, and uh, we moved it out of the municipal building. It had been there since memory, so um, things are working out very well there at the new site up in Estes Park. I wanted to highlight that. As well, we have uh, six new 24-hour drop boxes installed in Larimer County at this point. Those are located at CSU and Front Range Community College. Those two um, boxes uh, our walk up. You have to walk up to those boxes. However, the next four, Berthoud, Timnath, Wellington, and Red Feather Lakes are all drive through boxes, which um, I really worked hard to get drive through boxes. I think that's true convenience and um, helps to keep com from clogging parking spaces and those kind of things for voters. So, um, for the details on those exact locations, folks should go to votelarima.org or consult their instructions. As well, today specifically, as been our, has been as has been our um, 
policy in the past, we have a drive-through site here across the across from the courthouse, across House Street, um, where you can uh, just drive up and drop your ballot in. You don't have to to get out of their, your car, park in the parking lot, and use a 24-hour box outside um, in order to drop your ballot. So that's a true convenience for our citizens. Um, as of the end of yesterday, we had about 80,000 ballots in. That's really pretty impressive for Larimer County. Um, when you look at results across the state, we're really holding our own as far as a percentage of voters. So I'm very proud of that. Um, if we get more than 20,000 ballots today, we will continue uh, counting them tomorrow uh, because the process of counting ballots all takes place on the back end now. Those ballot envelopes must, signature must be verified on the exterior of the envelope before they're opened. The ballot, the envelopes must be opened, disassembled, um, run through county equipment, and all of those things take, take much labor and time. And so it takes us quite a bit of time. I make sure that there's clarity before we get started with the press and the public. If you care about um, election night results, you'll vote before election day, because if we get more than 20,000 ballots on election day, we will count, continue counting the next day. Thank you. Well, Signature is verified um, by com image screening like before? It's a great question. I get this question all the time. Folks uh, wonder how we can possibly check every single signature before a ballot envelope is opened, and I'm here to tell you we check every single signature and confirm it as you before that ballot envelope is opened. And we do so both with mechanics and or technology and through human um, uh, human eyeballs on it. The first process, the first leg of that process goes through a piece of equipment that checks the signature in a similar way that it's checked in banking. It compares a signature that's in the vote, statewide voter registration system with a signature that on, that's on the outside of your ballot envelope. Um, it cures, we call that curing, and it cures about 50% of those uh, ballots that come in. Um, the other 50%, now the that equipment also takes a picture of the signature block on that envelope. The, that picture only goes out to a bank of judges who also have a picture of your signature from the statewide voter registration system. Those judges work in a bipartisan team, and they agree or disagree that that is your signature. If they cannot agree, it then goes to a third uh, process that is another set of uh, bipartisan judges who now do have your ballot envelope in their hands and they also have exposure to other signatures that you have signed throughout the process of elections in that statewide voter registration system. If they agree or cannot agree it is your signature, now uh, you will get an eight-day letter. That eight-day letter will say you have until eight days after the election to cure your signature or your envelope will never be opened and your ballot will never be counted. So it's really important that folks who do receive that letter respond to it timely so that their, ba their ballot's counted. It's very important. So I noticed this year there's no secrecy sleeve. No secrecy sleeve. I was happy to see because yes. that saves paper and probably costs and yes. all kinds of things. What, what made that change possible? Well, I'm very proud of the reality that that uh, largely is in response to something that began here in Larimer County. We have, um, we have extraction equipment. Uh, I bought that back in 2013 when I was first clerk. And um, it allows for uh, uh, removal of the content of the ballot envelope without ever seeing the exterior of the envelope by the judges. It's a piece of equipment that slices uh, two sides of that envelope, runs that envelope through, the judge simply plucks the content as the automated machine moves to the next envelope. They're still doing that in a bipartisan team, but they don't have access to the exterior of the envelope, which would create any kind of a chance to see that voter along with their ballot. Um, since that is no longer reality, Secretary of State's office has allowed for counties that have this kind of extraction equipment to um, go without secrecy sleeves, which is really an improvement for you as a voter uh, because it's a little bit of a headache sometimes. We get complaints yearly about challenges with getting that ballot in that secrecy sleeve or in the envelope or what have you. People get concerned that if they didn't put their, their ballot in the secrecy sleeve and they've already sealed, now will it count? Um, all of those things. Also, when we get it back, um, it, it eases up our, um, our processes associated with disassembly and, of course, less cost to you as a taxpayer to create those secrecy sleeves and mail them to you. Good. Allows us to have less postage for a longer ballot as well. Good. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, uh, Angela. And, uh, by uh, what you just stated, that perhaps 80,000 ballots have been turned in, I think that's a significant jump from a couple of days ago when the Coloradoan reported that uh, we were maybe at 20 percent turnout. It looks like we're about 33 percent turnout. So. Um, the message is that people need to make informed decisions and certainly um, exercise their 
uh, their fundamental right uh, uh, to vote and responsibility, and hopefully they'll all do that by 7 p.m. It Thank is you. so important, absolutely. May I make one last comment? Uh, yes, of course. We had a candidate in Loveland, um, Ryan Firos, uh, who dropped out of the race. Folks who vote for that candidate, um, he dropped out after ballots were already processed and already out to voters. Um, if folks vote for that candidate, those votes will not be counted. Um, however, even if they vote for that candidate, all the rest of their votes on their ballot will count. Okay, so don't be confused there. Um, we have, um, if folks go to the voting booths and, and vote in person at any of our sites, they have, there's a, an alert there in the voting booth not to vote for that candidate in case, you know, because he has dropped out. So. Thank you. Thank any you. Any further questions or comments, Commissioner? No, nope, good Great. job. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time to be here to update us. Value your voting privilege. Every vote counts. Indeed. So there are no legal matters. Um, I don't, is there any other business that we need to conduct, uh, uh, Madam County Manager? None today, Commissioner. And before we adjourn, and I'll get this right eventually, uh, I wish to acknowledge and appreciate uh, Deirdre O'Neill from the Larimer County Clerk and Recorder's Office, who is doing an excellent job of taking the minutes of this meeting, and also Alicia Jeffers, who is not here at the moment, but uh, she was here to keep track of the public comment period and the timing and all sorts of other important logistical things. And uh, of course, our county manager, uh, by now everyone's figured out that she's over there. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you.